أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مد حقه القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العدون ولا يؤدي حقه المستحدون الذي لا يضركه بعد الحمام ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا والطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم وآل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العص والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم الجمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكان الناس أمة واحدة صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم the Quranic perspective on one nation has been our ongoing topic. Tonight is lecture number eight. Alhamdulillah, with the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now one week into the Ashra of Muharram 1442, 2020. And the attempt has been made for us to somehow understand uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant by Ummatun Wahida in the 213th verse of Surah Baqarah. And the purpose behind that, and there's been a few people who have been asking me that, you know, like, where are you going with this Ashra, basically? And it's, <laughs> it's a little bit sad that in, in eight, eight, eight days in now, we're, we're, we're wondering where I'm going with That means I haven't delivered it properly, but... I think the, uh, the, the notion and the idea of one collective, cohesive group towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is where we need to be. There's too many groups, there's too many firqe, there's too much separation, there's too many walls right now that exist in our families, in our communities, at the ummah at large. And that was never the purpose behind creation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is so intricately, precisely placed in this universe, and it, it is very interdependent. A structural, functional, interdependent universe is what we belong to. But the reality is that we don't see it like that. I don't see the person beside me as in instrumental for my perfection and my growth. But that's how we should be looking at it. One nation is the idea of you understanding, or me understanding, that every element of society plays a vital role for my growth. I am dependent on these elements for my growth, my perfection, and my spirituality. And when we begin to now understand that we are interdependent and everything around me now plays a vital role for my own perfection and my own spirituality, and because my spirituality is very near and dear to me, I'll have what? Respect for those things around me. And like I've said um, many times in the past week, you know, one nation idea is not the idea that everyone is right, everyone's correct. And it, it, it's a very, you know, pluralistic approach uh, where, you know, you have your, your, your faith and you have your system of belief and you have, you know, it's all correct. No, of course not. But everybody has a role to play. Even shaitan, even those who are the transgressors and the oppressors, they also have a role to play in my perfection. How? For example... Somebody who's an oppressor today taps into my courage, forces me now to wake up to my consciousness. Without the existence of that oppression, I may be somebody who falls prey to heedlessness and to ghafla, right? And to compla uh, uh, um, complacency. Uh, every element plays its role. And my only purpose behind this entire discussion with all of you is this idea that you know, we have to now come back full circle to that initial reality that Allah mentions in uh, Surah Baqarah, verse 213. Okay? Now, we've spoken about everything from the idea of collectivism in the beginning of the Ashra, 
to exactly how nations were in the beginning when there were only a few and how they grew and the problems that came about with that growth. In the past two nights now, um, we've spoken about uh, the barriers and the reasons why we've kind of gone into our little small groups. And one, of course, is the idea of elitism. I talked about divine fantasy. I talked about elitism by association. I talked about individualism in a me-centric era yesterday. And tonight, I want to mention one point that Allah Matabatai in Tafsir mentions, and that is that one of the primary reasons why the human being began to separate and so many differences came about was because knowledge inside of them increased. Okay. Now, one would think that with knowledge now, it's, that's a very virtuous thing, right? To be knowledgeable is great. In the world of akhlaq, in the world of Islamic morality, and, 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 you know, and I have a different uh, set of lectures that I'm doing in California every night on the, the Islamic morality system, on akhlaq, and in there we're talking about uh, you know, discussions from the book called Jamil Sadat. And while I don't want to repeat everything that I, I, I mentioned in that discussion, uh, last night, what is vital to our discussion on one nation is this idea and this notion that in the faculty of the intellect, right, there is a, um, there is, um, a deficient level of intellect, there is an excessive level of intellect, there's a moderate desired level of intellect. And all three of these levels produce different behavioral uh, traits and attributes. For example, I'm not going to expand because it's, it's not my topic, I don't want to lose my topic, a deficient amount of intellect um, you know, results in individuals who are foolish. Right? Individuals who, who, who don't make, who are ignorant, uh, obviously, right? Who have this jahal about them. And we can see that jahal and that ignorance today in society. Be it those who are simply ignorant, who refuse now to be knowledgeable, those who, of course, are egotistically ignorant. They're ignorant, but they don't know that they, they, they refuse to accept the fact that they're ignorant. When it is said to them, don't do fitna and fasad on the land, they say, us, we're the peacemakers. We're not the ones causing all sorts of corruption in Yemen and Palestine and Syria and Iraq. No, we're the peacemakers. We came to free the people from their governments. No, those are people who are egotistically ignorant. Right? That's a deficient level of the intellect. An excessive amount of intellect is that that knowledge now becomes a veil for you. Now please follow me. It's a very crucial discussion tonight. Becomes a veil for you. The moderate desired level of the intellect is wisdom. It's hikmat, right? To be a hakim, to be somebody who is wise in, in, in today's, today's ever-changing world is of utter importance. And so... Um, one of the areas that caused a lot of division in the early stages of human history was the fact that, you know, the human being uh, began to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, increased access to sciences and knowledge, okay? Where that knowledge should have brought everyone together and humbled them, it caused differences. It caused a little bit of tension. It caused separation, okay? It caused elitism. And I want to speak tonight about another factor that possibly can be used for us to come back together to that one nation. Now, tomorrow being, uh, you know, um, um, the day before the day of Ashura and Shabi Ashura, essentially, I want to make sure that we, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we send off the right message. And that is that, you know, this one nation, how can we achieve this one nation? Where do we start with this one nation? And I'm going to speak about the families tomorrow. I always speak about families because the, the, the jud of the root of success of any community is a successful family. And the root of all evil in community is an evil family. That, inshallah, is tomorrow. But tonight, let's, let's understand this idea of knowledge. Okay? The problem is that we, um, we know a lot. And this is where I'm coming from, and maybe I'm wrong, and I'm sure all of you will tell me if I'm wrong. In a good way, of course. If we uh, count and measure the amount of hours of azadari that we've done in our own lifetime, depending on how old you are uh, listening to me, 
it could be, you know, in the thousands, thousands of hours of azadari, meaning of majalis. If one majlis equals an hour, let's say, right? You do your hisab and you count and you find out that hundreds, if not, for some of you, thousands. There are some of you pre-COVID that used to do, you know, four or five a day majlises across two months for your entire life. You do the math. In every majlis of Imam Hussein, there should be, and usually there is, some sort of taskira or some sort of a discussion on, you know, on the deen, on akhlaq, on behavior, on islah, on tarikh, on Qur'an, on the Ahlul Bayt, on ma'rifat of the imam, fadal of the imams, uh, you know, masaib of the imam, all of them should have some element, if not all of those, inside at least one, you know, one majlis. Tigay. Now imagine this beautiful package of taqwa building ingredients inside of you, right? Knowledge, knowledge of, of the Ahlul Bayt, of the Qur'an, these are all beautiful avenues of spirituality. And this package is times a hundred, times a thousand, however many hours there should be. That should kind of result in this, an, um, this amazing nation. Like imagine if we told a non-Shia, a non-Muslim who's oblivious to the entire system of Azadari, that we as a Shia nation, we do this. This is what we do every single year since I could remember. And they ask, what do you discuss? Oh, we discuss, we discuss everything from piety to uh, strengthening your family to, uh, you know, uh, honesty to sacrifice to things like, you know, collectivism to things like unity to things like, you know, uh, believing in God, being God-fearing, you know, being patient through, uh, through hardships. If you ask me, this person would be amazed. You guys gather like this every single year for at least two months straight, and you talk about these beautiful, life-changing uh, discussions? And we say, yeah, we do. Should, you know, would that person not expect the Shia nation to be somewhere else today? Somewhere else today. And we're not. We're not. So either that means that the job is not, de not, not being done from this side of the, of, of the camera or from that side of the camera. And if you ask me, it's a little bit of both. If the right message is delivered from the member, the right message has to be applied from the listeners. Okay? But sometimes, the, you know, the wrong message is from the member and the wrong message is taken from the audience as well. Anyways, my point is that it's not a shortage of knowledge. It's an incorrect, an incorrect istimal and usage of that knowledge. Or it's a lack of application of that knowledge. And that's what I want to speak on tonight. Because the way that Alama Tabatabai in tafsir of this, of, this, of, of this verse says, that as the knowledge of the, of the man increased way back when initially, as the human being increases, the differences now also began to increase. Okay? There was a sense of ego amongst those who were more knowledgeable. There's a sense of the fact that I'm now stronger than you. And sometimes in our innate nature, right, inside, sometimes built in our character is the idea that the strong now does what? Oppresses the weak because it can. It can. You know, right now, this, th th this whole discussion on injustice right now happening in, in, in the U.S., you know, NBA players are walking out and WNBA players are walking out and all power to them. You know, they're giving up salaries and, 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 and the league is giving up uh, TV money and everything and all this time, you know, to kind of, you know, uh, uh, send a clear message that what happened to Jacob Blake is one, is one example, but it is, you know, how much more can be done, right? And we're all for that. Of course, everyone supports that idea. But I think in this era, we have to, again, not my topic, but very, very quickly, we have to search inside of us sometimes to find out that is there a racist inside of me? Is there a bigot inside of me? Is there an elitist inside of me? Is there a fir'aun inside of me? Okay? And the only way sometimes that we can truly measure if we have a fir'aun inside of us is to examine those that we can do zulm against, that we can be unjust against, against and ask ourselves, am I being unjust to them or not? And what I mentioned last night and in the past two nights in my after uh, 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 Maghrib 
a speech in Toronto is the fact that the two people that have always been subject to zulm and oppression since day number one in history have been children and women, always. So if you're a father and a husband inside the audience, ask yourself, do I do zulm on my wife, zulm on my children? Why do I do zulm? Because I can. I'm stronger than them. I have more authority than them. If I'm their wali and I have that wilayat, does that mean that I can do zulm on them? Does, it, does that mean that I can verbally abuse my child and verbally abuse my wife and body shame her or God forbid d d domestically abuse her, which is a rampant issue right now, or God forbid strip her of her dignity by having extracurricular relationships outside the marriage? All these things are rampant right now in our communities, right? The only way that we can truly call anybody out for their injustice is if we can stop and ask ourselves about our injustice. So the people of knowledge, let's, call, let's, let, let's come back to my topic. That's not my topic, that's another topic for another, uh, another place. But Alama Tabat Tabai says that knowledge that initially the human being began to, began to increase and grow with and learn, that, that actually was a tool used to do what? To oppress those who are weaker than them. Take advantage of those who are weaker than them. Strip the rights of those who are not as educated. So while that ilm should have resulted in something positive, it actually resulted in what? In walls, divisions, right? Injustice, uh, you know, the law being broken, et cetera, et cetera. Which means that it's not the problem with the knowledge, it's the problem with the uh, acquiring of that knowledge. Okay? I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Okay? The question is why? Why are, why are we not, as a Shia nation, better? Why are our communities not stronger? Why aren't our marriages better? Why are, aren't our kids more faithful if we have this Aza and this institution of Azadari? Nobody, I'm sorry. You look up, up and down the Islamic uh, different sects of Islam, look up and down the major religions. Nobody has the treasures, the treasures of knowledge and spirituality like we do as the Shias. At least access to those treasures. Nobody has the du'as of the Ahl al-Bayt, the Ahadis of the Ahl al-Bayt. Nobody has the Hawza of the Shias and Najat al-Qum. No one does. We have those treasures, right? We have those blessings. We do. And to still see the fact that men abuse their, their, their wives and, 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 and parents abuse their children by telling them at the age of eight that you'll amount to nothing, you're a zero, you're a worth of time, you're a na laik bacha. At the age of eight, at the age of eight, stripping them of their dignity. Right? Who? This is a Shia of Imam Hussein, a Azadar of Imam Hussein, who has access and have heard hundreds and thousands of hours of majalis. From who? From ulama, from grand ulama. Something is missing, guys. There's a disconnect somewhere. And the disconnect speaks to the fact that we have knowledge sometimes incorrectly labeled as the path to spirituality. No doubt. You have to know. But Imam Khomeini says that sometimes that knowledge and that ilm becomes a veil for us. It closes our eyes when it really should be opening our basirat and insight. So what is that missing ingredient? Amal. Amal. Those individuals, those individuals, back then that Alama talks about, are individuals who had knowledge. They were scientists, astronomers, mathematicians. Absolutely. But part of the process of ta'lim is tazkiyah. Part of the process of educating yourself, and I ask any of you, doesn't matter in what line you educate yourself in, and you have heard me say this several times, that ilm in Islam is not subject-based, it's niyat-based, okay? Niyat-based. You could find God uh, in the OR. You can find God auditing a company. You can find God, you know, with a telescope. Meaning, meaning you know, you, the, the presence of God, not God himself, of course. Right? You don't always need to find God in Najaf and Qum. In fact, there are people who lose God. I'm sorry, in Najaf and Qum. It's true. Right? So, so ilm, ilm. The Prophet says, ilm is abadan and adiyan. Secular and spiritual. But they're both considered to be ilm. Provided it takes us back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyways, the problem is that if that ilm is alone without purification, that ilm can very easily not only become a veil, but become a reason for your arrogance. 
So my youth out there who are who are who are pre med going down the road road of of, of becoming a doctor, a, uh, you know, a, a person right now who's running a very successful business, a person right now who's studying to be I don't know a, a PhD student or an accountant, let's say, or a lawyer or anything that might bring in a good amount of money as in terms of a salary. Always remember for that salary, for that status, for Mr. MD not to get to your head, you have to purify your soul. Without the tazkiyah, the ta'aleem can easily deviate you from the path of Allah. It's ilm, it's knowledge, it's, it's, it's beautiful, it should be virtuous. It has to be compound and mixed and joined with purification. Right? Surah Jum'ah says, The primary purpose of sending the Prophet of Allah to Mecca, relate to them the signs, look at the tartib, look at the sequence now. Purify them, purify them, then teach them. Purify them, then teach them. Purify them, then teach them. Because we don't need to, to have a lot for us to feel like we're elites, right? Our nose goes in the air, our chest comes out. Right? If we know a little bit, if we know a little bit, even to the point we have the himmah to sit on the member during the first Asha of Muharram when we, we don't have any business doing that. Why? I've read a book. I used to be neighbors of an alim, for example. Right? Maybe I have good khitabat and I have a good, you know, uh, 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 oratory skills. This is the first 10 days of Muharram. What business do you have being on the member? Just because you have a little bit of a thicker beard and maybe a nice accent, maybe you've read one book. Anyways, not my topic, I wish it was. So knowledge by itself, apparently from the tafsir, not only is it not enough, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. So what is it that strips knowledge of that danger? It's amal. Why do I mention this tonight? Because the, the, the fastest growing religion inside of the U.S., and I would say North America, but more the U.S., is no religion at all. Is no religion at all. You know what that means? That means that this whole concept of organized religion um, is one that our youth and our youngsters are running away from. Like my biggest fear, my biggest fear, one of my biggest fear uh, of how our communities will look post-pandemic, TK. The pandemic is over, everything is okay, you know, the numbers are still kind of, you know, going to be there, the vaccine comes, just like the flu, whatever, you know, we kind of live our life and if the flu comes, we take the vaccine or we rest and inshallah everything will be okay. That's how I, I, that, that's how I, how I see things going. I don't think corona will be gone forever. It's going to be around. It's a matter of us functioning as, as a society around this pandemic. Of, of course, I'm not a doctor. I don't pretend to be one. Um, which means that our centers are going to open. They're going to open. I mean, it, it's not going to always be like this. My concern and my fear is that when the centers open, the youth don't come back to the building. I've realized in the past four or five months, the one group that is loving this online system, this virtual uh, masjid idea or the youth. You know, when, when, when my center, uh, one of the first, if not the first in Toronto, began to say, you know what, uh, for the month of Zil Hijjah, uh, we're going to go ahead and open up our centers. Okay? So, you know, where I am right now in Toronto, our numbers are fairly good. You guys are a mess in the U.S. And uh, in Canada, at least, we're fairly good. Some areas, uh, you know. So when we began to open up in phase three, the allowance of people in a building, especially in places of worship, was, was higher, okay? And so right away, the thought was, you know, three months, four months, we're sitting at home, we need to be in our centers, you know, and I get it, my elders especially, you know, their social, out, their social break is the center. They rely heavily on the center, of course, and they should, mashallah. That's their community, right? That's their outlet. That's, they're socializing once a week. So now pressure, 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 you know, open and said, oh, Alhamdulillah, and so far it's been going good. So all of Zilhaj, every program in Zilhaj, from Ghadir to Mubahila to Jashans and Madrasas, all of them are open. Registration, six feet apart, wearing a mask, uh, only 30 people uh, allowed on one side, blah, 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 everything was done, okay? The, f the, the, the thing that I found to be a little bit um, worrisome was that the ones who were, who were running, running to register to go 
and sit in these programs and in the building uh, were the elders. Okay? Um, and when it came time for us to kind of, for, 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 for my community to plan between Mahorn, and we always have an English and Urdu Ashar together, the idea was, do we make them both on the premise? Like, do we open the building for both? And a resounding no from the youth was that, look, keep our Ashra, our English speaker, online. You can have your Urdu on the premises, in the building after Maghrib, albeit in a very, very restricted format. Which told me that they're loving it. They're, they're loving it. The English communities across North America right now have, you know, I, I think they're benefiting from this pandemic. The Urdu ones that are strictly Urdu, even the countries in Urdu, they haven't quite, you know, trained or they're, they're not ready for this online, you know, live sort of Muharram even. Right? So those people, those ulama who go from here to, let's say, Karachi or Pakistan for Muharram, they're grounded here. They might, uh, a few of them might go in London, whatever, but most of them are grounded. Anyways, my point is that, you know, my fear is that the youth today will no longer see the need of the actual building and the actual structure, and they'll adopt the virtual masjid idea. It's convenient, it's comfortable, I'm getting what I want, and I'm comfortable while I'm doing it, right? And one thing about these millennials is that, good or bad, they search for the most convenient way to do anything. Okay? And that's great, I mean, you know, because of them we have apps and we have conveniences and we have smartphones, and I get it. But, you know, they apply that now to everything across the board. So why commute 45 minutes to a building and waste 90 minutes in commute when I can sit there in my pajamas and watch Asad Bhai on my couch? Dude, what's better than that, man? No commute, no parking, right? No uh, uh, annoying elders, no uh, bratty youth, nothing. Sit there, you know, it's beautiful. And when I'm done, I log off and I go straight to bed. Save on gas, save on time. Oh my goodness. And that's a problem for me. And the problem is that they will begin to now downplay the importance of the structure. Now, why do I bring this up? Because the structure, the building, the masjid is a avenue, is a place of organized religion. Why do the, the, the studies say that the fastest growing religion is no religion at all? Because today's youth are beginning to slowly now move away from organized religion. The fiqh, the usul al the sharia, they don't feel a need for it. I'm a good person, I believe in God. If I don't pray every single day, five times a day, doesn't make me a horrible person. If I don't cover my hair when I leave the house, doesn't make me a horrible person. If, for example, I don't give my homes to 20% of my hard-earned money, I'm not a bad person. I believe, of course I believe in God. Of course, he's, a, he's, a, he's my spiritual father, he's my object, blah, 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 of, 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 of hajat and worship. Yes, of course. But these nitty-gritty details of the, of, of, of the sharia and the abadat that make sure, you know, seven places of my body are on the ground for sajda. <laughs> make sure that my wudu is just slightly above my elbow. What if I want to wash my bicep with it? I can't do that. What if I just want to wash my wrist and my hand? Look, what, what's going to happen? Why so many details for something that's so dear and near and dear to my heart? I have the knowledge of God. I have the knowledge of the deen. What stops it from becoming a veil for me is organized religion. Always remember that. The law of love of God is organized religion. And I, wherever I go this, this Muharram, I'm mentioning that whenever I can, wherever I can, because I'm seeing a trend that's disturbing to me, disturbing to me. Oh my goodness, if it was up to these guys, man, the Muslim would never open, we'd be all virtual. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe some of you guys miss seeing each other, uh, you know, chai, breaking bread. Like, yeah, I do miss it, but I can always invite them over. Come, let's have a viewing party. Right now, there's 10 guys right now in someone's house watching me right now live, let's say, for example. Organized religion is a language of love of God. The language of love of God tells me that I need to worship God the way He wants to be worshipped. Right? I've spoken about language of love with all of you guys before. The idea that if I claim to love somebody, if she is my beloved, he is my beloved, meaning that my wife or my daughter, whatever the case may be, or my son or my husband, I have to find out how they want to be loved. Because they're the object of my love, they get to dictate how it is that I want to be loved. 
If you want to love me, this is how I want to be loved. If you want to treat me right, this is what treats me right. I don't get to dictate to my wife that, look, I love you, and this is how I'm going to love you. She's like, okay, well, good for you. Then that's all what? An individualistic, me-centric love. Remember that from yesterday. A me-centric love. But I'm telling you that this is what makes me happy. Yeah, I know that makes you happy, but this is how I want to love you. But it's not your love. You're giving your love to me, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, wait a second, you're worshiping me. And you get to dictate to me how to worship me? Eh. Acha. I mean, I'm the object of your worship. I'm your ma'bud. Everything that comes down from me, nitty gritty details, are from me, not from anything else. And you want to, you know, call the shots? And Shaitan tried. Shaitan said, look, Allah, remove this Adam business. Remove this hukum for sajda. I will worship you woo, like nobody else would. Just, I can't bow down to Adam. Allah says, you don't get to tell me how to worship me. I will tell you how to worship me. Allah's language of love, Allah's language of worship is organized religion. The faster we accept organized religion, the faster we will get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before that, that knowledge of God becomes a veil, becomes a reason for what? Separation. Becomes a reason for injustice. For me to look down on people. There are some people who are well-read, no doubt, well-read. But oh man, that ego they have. They come in and they, and, and, and they overtake the whole conversation. That knowledge should make you humble, Baba. Then you're out there all of a sudden now, you've read a couple of books now, and you're, 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 you're tackling Islamic uh, history and, and, and putting up your own YouTube videos uh, all of a sudden because all, all these ulama, <coughs> these big scholars, for years now, are, have it all wrong, me, me alone, sitting in my corner in the U.S. now, or in Canada, you know, with a few people in front of me, I figured out, for example, that this historical fact that's been presented, presented all these years is all wrong. All these 20, 25 ulama who have hundreds of years of Hausa studies combined together are all wrong. Me, by myself, I'm okay, I'm right. And so I videotape it, put it on YouTube, then send the YouTube link out. That's knowledge? Is that knowledge? Because we've taken knowledge to mean information. And it's not. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. He says that knowledge is a journey, a journey of nur. That no doubt starts off with ma'alumat, they say. Information in your brain. You sit there in, a, in an usher of maharam, and if the alim is, is, <coughs> is good, and not wasting your time like I have been for the past week. If he's good, if the <coughs> sorry, if the alama is good, then um, um, that becomes information inside your brain. Okay, I'm just gonna grab a water. Please give me one second. Sorry about that. So <coughs> that uh, information is in the brain. That now has to descend onto the heart. So it's no good in the brain. There's lots of things in the brain. It has to come down to the heart. Once it comes down to the heart, then it has to convert into amal. So what was once what I know now becomes what I do. What was once my ilm becomes my amal. The lam and the meme now simply switch. And so it's, it's vital and it's important that we understand that part of the process of us coming back to a one cohesive, harmonized movement is the fact that we need to understand that our knowledge, while it's important, could very, could very well could be a veil for us. Unless we attach amal to it. The language of love of the Ahl bayt for example. The language of love of the Ahl bayt that in Quranic terms is known as mawadda. It's for us to identify that, yes, no doubt, I love Imam Hussein. I love Imam Hussein. That's why I am here every single 10 days trying to make my, the, the best of this coronavirus, COVID, Muharram, no doubt. 
and we have a golden opportunity to say, look, Imam Hussein, this Muharram, I changed myself. I revolutionized myself. That only happens when we practically apply what we know. Ayatollah Bahajad, rahmatullah alayh, the biggest, one of the biggest artists and ulama of our time, he says, if only we are able to act on what we know. I'm not asking anybody to go into a library and spend hours and hours and hours on studying this and studying that and this and that. And sometimes, you know, these guys, these youth ask me for, oh, can you send me Ibn Arabi books and Ibn Sina books and Mullah Sadra books? These are big philosophers. I said, for what? Oh, we just want to learn about, you know, uh, this, learn about that. That's great. And I, what I want to say to them, and I don't because I don't want to deflate them, I might now, of course, but I don't want to deflate them. And that is that, look, Baba, why don't you just, why don't we, all of us, act on what we've heard so far? Let's simplify the deen. It's not all about, you know, dropping names and quoting and this and that. And, you know, you know well, in, in Isharat, uh, you, you know, Ibn Sina says this. Let's, let's show how much we know by how much we do. We don't want to be an alim bi amal and a jahil ba amal. We don't want to be that. We don't want to be a scholar that doesn't act or an ignorant one that does act. Right? We don't want to be somebody who has knowledge, 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 but when it comes to the maidan of amal and deeds, zero. Zero. But we don't want to be those who are pounding out amal, 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 oh my good, that this amal and that mustahab and that amal and this Quran and this surah and this dua and this namaz. Jabbi deko, oh my god, they're doing about that. But if you ask them about Allah, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. It's hollow, right? So both of them are extremes, right? Back then, when one of the causes of division inside the human being, and I'm sorry, even today, the causes that we have sometimes in our families and our communities is the fact that we have been quite grouped what we know with what we do. They've become two separate realities. I know a lot up here, but I do something different with my hands. Yeah, Milana, I know that I should be treating my wife properly, but I know I should be you know, uh, wearing hijab, but I know that I should be you know, paying my khums, following my marja, but, yeah, but, this yeah, but has to go. I'm sorry, has to go. Has to go. If we simply acted on what we knew he would say, the ummah would be in a different spot today altogether. Just act on what you know. And there are some people who are excellent at that. Where do we start now? What do we do? How do we do it? How, you know? Let's understand. Every detail of the Sharia is not created by some creation. Every detail of the Sharia has come down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every detail. He chose various avenues to reveal that Sharia. Sometimes there are open verses of the Quran. Sometimes there are Sunnat of, uh, of the Prophet. Sometimes there are Ahadith of the Ahl al-Bayt. Sometimes it's through our Aql and the Fatwas of the Marajah. But to discard this, to say, you know, I don't need organized religion, is false. That's when knowledge becomes a veil. And so in this Muharram, if we ever want to focus on anything, you know, if, if, if you're someone who's had a talk with yourself that this Muharram is going to be different, it's going to be different, I ask you, where do you start? And there's a lot. It, it, sometimes it's overwhelming. And let me keep it very simple for all of you, please. Very simple for all of you. Start with Salat. Get your Namaz down. That's it. Everything else will follow. Get your namaz. Namaz is the jad. Namaz is the root. Namaz is the base of the entire building of your, uh, of your building of amal. <clears throat> okay? No one starts building on the 15th floor. You can't. You need something to, to rest on. Every deed of ours is resting on salat and namaz. Okay? That's where you start. Imam Hussein, you gave your life, you sacrificed you and your family and your, and your companions for the sake of the, uh, 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 of the deen. The pillar the pillar of the furu of the deen is salat. I'm going to get my salat down packed. These are simple, simple, simple reminders. And you guys know me very well. I'm, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I, don't, I don't present mind-blowing content, you know, big, big four-syllable words. No, there's other speakers for that. You can go there for that. That's fine. You come here, bhati saade, saade al This is how I am, because I'm a saade insan, mashallah. I don't look like one, but I, inside, very simple. Start with your Salat. 
don't wait for this light to come in for your salat. The problem is that the, the, we, they don't see, the, today's youth, it may, again, let me know if I'm wrong. Today's youth don't see a problem, uh, or, sorry, don't see a, 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 the reason why I should prescribe to organize religion if I don't know why I'm doing it. And that's the problem. Right? You have to look at the deeds and the amal with the, with, 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 with the lens of submission. That if my creator said to do A, that's enough for me. I, I, I will do A. If later on that creator gives me the tawfiq and inspiration and the gift of understanding why A is wajib, then fine. If not, it's not a prerequisite. I just don't feel like it, Malana. I said, Bhai, I need to feel like I want to pray namaz. Allah, you're feeling, feeling. I want these emotions. I, you know, I don't feel. So right now, I'm, you know what? Today, I'm, I, until I get that feeling, I'm just going to take a break, right? Let me take off my hijab for a week, see how that feels. If it feels bad, then I know that hijab was good, right? Let's put it back on. Right? Let me take a, a, a step back. Maybe, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll fast every second day just so I understand the importance of fasting in the month of Ramadan. You would be shocked to find out how many people email me and say, is it okay if I fast every second day in the month of Ramadan just so I don't become, you know, it, it, it doesn't become monotonous. It doesn't become like, you know, like habitual. I want to really capture the ruh of the month of Ramadan. So I'm going to skip one roza and Fast and, and fast the next day and skip one was a fast the next day. Mashallah. Mashallah. Gio Hazar Sagar. Really, really. May Allah bless you. This is a this is a joke. It's 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 a game. We haven't understood submission. We're submitting to ourselves. That's why yesterday's yesterday's talk was so vital. Me centric in our worship means that until I understand it, I'm gonna worship. Where's God in all this? <laughs> Where is God in all this? It's not a prerequisite. Okay? It could be that you despise something, but it's good for you. It could be that you love something, it's detrimental for you. Sometimes how we feel, how I feel, has nothing to do with anything. Submit and submit, and that's it. I mentioned that yesterday. Because that amal now will what? Will simplify. And will what? And will purify the knowledge. Yeah, that's a better way of saying it. That worship will purify the knowledge. Without that worship, the knowledge can be tainted. And when knowledge is tainted, it becomes the ego very quickly. The more you submit, the more you realize your maqam and your station and your level in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then no matter you could be a, a mustahab, you could be a maraja, you'll be the most humble man. The more I knew, Ibn Sina says, the more ignorant I became to myself. The more I knew, the more I knew how much I didn't know. Oh, the more I read, the more I studied, the more I realized my own jahalat. That's what ilm should bring. Not that the more I study, the more knowledgeable I am than this person and that person. Yeah, he has no idea what he's talking about. I know, na? I know. Ooh, the ego that comes from knowledge. Whew. Baba, purify that, man. It's dirty, clear. Go on the musalla and, and, cl and clean your knowledge. <laughs> Let your forehead taste the khak of Karbala. Then you understand. And all of these principles are all Islamic principles that my Aqa and Mullah Hussein left his comfortable, comfortable Medina to do what? To sacrifice. Uphold these principles of the deen. And he brought with him some of the most biggest and the most strongest warriors of his time. And tonight we remember the commander of the army of Imam Hussein. Abu al-Fazl was no ordinary man. Chosen for this day of Ashura. Trained by his father, Amir al-Mu'mini. A giant of a man, a warrior of a man. The man who instilled fear in the hearts of the enemy. Nothing about him was mamuli. Nothing about him was ordinary. There's robe. There's a presence. 
the only man to get to the banks of Farat. Do you ever wonder how that's possible? That he would enter, let's say, the Maidan, and the army would split. He would split the army just by his presence. <laughs> he comes to Imam Hussein, Mawla, give me ijazat, Mawla. This is a very hard shahadat <clears throat> to recite. And if I miss everything, you'll forgive me. Sometimes you just don't have the heart for it. It's very difficult, these musibas, to listen to, to recite, to recall. But we're simply retelling an event that my Mola Hussein experienced not just across 10 days, he experienced in one day from the Adhan of Ali Akbar until Qad Qutla Hussein Bikar Asri Ashur. Mola, give me ijazat, Abbas. You are the Sardar of my Lashkar. You are my Alamdar. Mola, give me ijazat. Mola, give me ijazat. The sounds of Ala Atash are killing me. Looking at your dry lips are killing me. I know I can get water. I know I can e defeat this enemy. Give me ijazat. Give me ijazat. When all of the uh, 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 Ashab are gone and some of the Bani Hashim are gone, when uh, finally Abu Fazl comes to Imam Hussein again, says, Mullah, give me ijazat. Abbas, you're my alamdar. Abbas, you're my salar. Abbas, you're the head of my army. He would look around and says, Mullah, what army is left that I'm your alamdar of? He says, Abbas, if you want to go, go and get water for the children. Imam Hussein now prepares Abu Fazl for battle. Gives him the alam and the mushk of Sakina, this water sack called the mushk that you fill with, with water. Alam in, inside, he roars into, into the maidan of Karbala, Ana Abbas ibn Ali, I am the son of Amir al they see the, en the, the enemy sees Abbas coming and they get out of the way. He gets down to Farad, begins to fill the mushk of Sakina and that very famous picture of him having water inside of his, his palm. If he had taken a sip of water, Abbas was dying of thirst. Abbas had been this the second of Muharram. Abbas was very thirsty. Abbas was hot. Abbas was on the plains of the desert of Karbala and that water was fresh. The water was cold. Had he drank one sip, nobody would have questioned him. But how could he, in one palm, he hears Allah. Atash, ala atash, Sakina is thirsty. On one hand, he sees the dry lips, cracked lips of his Mawla Hussein. He drops the water. My salams to the Wafadari of Ibas. Meanwhile, in the tents now, Imam Hussein mentions to everybody that Abbas is gone for water. Sakina gathers all the kids, gives them all little kuzas, they say little small cups they had, and said, my chacha Abbas is going, my chacha Abbas is going to bring water, and no, he'll bring water. Oh, don't worry, you won't be thirsty for too long. You'll get water soon. She's getting the children ready, as the books say, and they're all getting this, this excitement that Bani is coming, water is coming, Abbas is going to bring water, Abbas is going to bring water, and the whole time her eyes are fixed on the alam. The alam is strong, my chacha Abbas is strong. Abbas fills the mushk of Sakina, roars his way back towards the khaymah of Imam Hussein. Omar ibn Sa'ad realizes if this water gets to Hussein, it's going to be a problem. They begin now to surround the man. They begin to attack the man. Those who had arrows through uh, uh, spears, through spears. Those who had rocks through rocks. Those who had anything through anything. Just get the water back from Abbas. Just get the water back from Abbas. There comes a moment now where one man'un comes out of the bush and ambushes the right arm of Abbas. He grabs the mushka. He grabs the alam in his left hand. Keeps roaring. Get, 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 get water to Hussein. Get water to Sakina. Sakina watching the alam waver back and forth. My chacha is coming. He's close. My chacha is coming. There comes another malaun and chops off the other arm. Now the alam is between the legs, the mushk inside of his mouth. He's now roaring towards Imam Hussein. Get water back to the khaymah. Get water back to the khaymah. Omar ibn Sa'a says, Hormala, get your archers ready. Shower the man with arrows. An entire rain of arrows comes towards the boss. One now hits his leg. He pulls it out. One hits his shoulder. He pulls it out. One goes in his eye. But 
But the one arrow that killed the man was the arrow that hit the musk of Sakina. Water began to flow out the musk. The musk is empty as at the bus stops. Where does he go? What a courageous man. Think about it. He has no arms to fight the enemy. He has no water for the Khaimah. What does Abbas do? Abbas turns around and goes right back into, into, into the heart of the enemy. Somehow begins to fight the enemy. No arms, no weapons, no nothing. I can't go back to Sakina without water. At that moment now Abbas falls from the horse. Alama Majusi narrates. Every year I see this narration. Sayyidah Fatima came in his dream one night. Says Majusi, you recited the Masaib of my Abbas, but not the Musiba Shahzadi. I read what I could. What did I miss? She says, tell whoever this thing to the Musiba of my Abbas that when somebody falls from a horse, they use their arms to break their fall. My Abbas didn't have arms to break his fall. He fell on that arrow. Assalamu alaikum. Ya Abba Abdullah. Imam Hussein goes roaring into the Maidan of Karbala. Abbas, what have you done? Mola, I'm sorry. I'm Sharminda. I couldn't get you water. What what would you like? Just leave my body right here on the banks of Farat. Imam Hussein goes back to the Khayma. Bibi Sakina comes running out. She sees the Alam. She does not see the Alamdar. Chacha Abbas, your Sakina is not thirsty anymore. Sayyallamu al-Ladhina Zalamu. Ayyamu al-Qalibin. Ayyamu إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ مَعْتَمِ حُسَيْنِ يَا حُسَيْنِ